Yeah, the College of uh, Palliative Medicine. It's it's a monthly uh, webinar series. So this month also, we are very happy and honored to announce. Uh, announce. Um, I will introduce this times uh, this month. Um, uh, Dr. Sunet Karuna Ratna, uh, who will talk about do not count the days, make days count in stage heart failure. So it is a very important topic in terms of palliative medicine. Uh, the heart failures, we should know how to, how to treat, how to tackle the patients with heart failure. So Sunit will talk about it. So Dr. Sunit, MBBS, MD, MRCP, UK, MRCPS, Please uh, mute your phone, uh, the phones or your computers, otherwise it will be a disturbance. So Dr. Sunit um, is MBBS, MD, MRCP UK, MRCPS Glasgow, MRCP Specialty, Certificate in Diabetics and Endocrinology. So Dr. Sunit Ratna, Primary Medical Qualification, MBBS from the University of Colombo in 2007, completed his MD medicine in 2013 at PGIM. Uh, uh, the, before proceeding to post-MD training in cardiology at the Institute of Cardiology, National Hospital of Sri Lanka, before the board certification as a consultant cardiologist, he worked as a clinical fellow in cardiology in Acute Hospital NHS Trust in UK for two years. So he is currently attached to the teaching hospital on Radhapura, working as a consultant uh, interventional cardiologist so his interests are acute cardiac interventions, heart failure, and diabetes. It's a very, you know, timely, uh, you know, the topics where it concerns of palliative care. So, and um, I thank you, Dr. Sunit, uh, uh, for the, you know, agreement of doing this webinar with the short, very short notice, because our plan, this, this month plan was Dr. Renuka Jayatis' talk about the nutrition, but uh, he went abroad, she went abroad, so that is why it was a very short notice. So thank you so much, Dr. Sunit, for take, uh, to, uh, this thing. So I will uh, open the floor, give the floor to Dr. Sunit Karnaratna to talk about um, today's topic, do not count the days, make days count in stage heart failure. Over to you, Dr. Sunil. Uh, good, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk about heart failure. Uh, so I know there, there's uh, one of the important matches going on. So uh, all the people who are joining us, uh, Thank you. So we'll start. So the objective source of today's discussion is uh, we have to understand what is advanced and it's in stage heart failure. Uh, we'll just have a brief look at current guideline directed medical therapy device therapy for heart failure. And uh, hopefully we would be able to realize the complex nature of managing advanced heart failure. And we should uh, discuss how to how we could try to bridge the gap between patient expectations and the reality. Uh, and uh, you should be, hopefully, we should be uh, able to look at the heart failure. And so we will be confident in uh, managing in stage heart failure. Uh, and uh, at the end of this uh, session, we'll we think you would be empowered to address symptom control needs of heart failure patients who are having end of uh, in stage heart failure and be proactive in discussing advanced care planning uh, in severe heart failure. Awareness of, you will be aware of the ethical dilemmas that might arise uh, during management of in stage heart failure uh, and consider what is right for the individual patient and family. So we, as we know, heart failure is a complex clinical syndrome. Actually, 
uh, it's very important that it is a clinical syndrome because we don't do not need any investigations actually to diagnose heart failure. A clinical diagnosis, which is characterized by specific set of symptoms and signs. For example, you have weight gain, edema, shortness of breath, and uh, fatigue. Why why is it important to talk about heart failure? It's, it's a highly prevalent disease. Uh, if we talk about uh, a cardiologist perspective, uh, at least about one third of our work uh, is regarding managing heart failure patients. It is a progressive, often incurable, and ultimately fatal chronic disease. And uh, you'll be surprised to know that it's the five-year mortality is sometimes greater than some of the malignancies. So it is, it is a, a, a severe and progressive disease. And many people with heart failure have multiple comorbidities, which may complicate the issues. There are different forms of heart failure, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, heart failure with mild reduced ejection fraction. And we see lots of patients who develop heart failure as a result of valvular, valvular heart disease and there is grown-up congenital heart disease, a sizable proportion, and genetic cardiomyopathies. On the other hand, heart failure is a uh, disease with excellent evidence-based treatment, treatment options. There are many ongoing studies as well. There is a rapidly changing landscape of heart failure management. So what, what, whatever we discussed uh, last year may not apply today. So it's changing rapidly. That may complicate your management of end-stage heart failure as well. So if you look at the uh, American College of Cardiology stages of heart failure, actually what we are going to discuss is stage D heart failure. They are symptomatic in which a class three or four symptoms despite on being on guideline medical therapy or you are unable to prescribe optimal guideline directed medical therapy because of patient does not tolerate the medication. So if you look at, if you briefly look at the management of heart failure, now we have uh, mainly four classes of drugs, which are very beneficial in heart failure and have shown prognostic benefit in multiple randomized clinical trials, namely uh, RAS, inhibitor, RAS inhibitors, that means ARNI, AC inhibitors and ARBs beta blockers, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists such as spinalactone, and now a new member SGLT2 inhibitors. We consider these four, the top four, uh, we, we call them fantastic four in managing heart failure with uh, heart failure, especially heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Diuretics, of course, they are mainly for symptomatic benefit, uh, and we do not consider they are prognostically important. Uh, so our aim is to, as soon as possible, start the heart failure patients on all these uh, optimal guideline medical therapy and proceeding for uh, maximum tolerated doses, followed by uh, we look whether they have any indication for devices such as ICD or CRT. And then uh, we may, if the patient is not respond to any of these treatments, there are some other treatments available such as uh, cardiac transplantation. So this is one of one of my favorite slides uh, because uh, when you manage heart failure, it's very important to give uh, the either maximum tolerated doses or uh, uh, or or the maximum recommended doses. Otherwise, uh, the problem is we might see, we might think that the patient is not responding to treatment while, uh, while actually the patient is on minimal doses because we see uh, most of the times some patients who come to our clinics are on carbidilol 3.125 milligrams twice daily or in 2.5 milligrams twice daily. And they have been on those doses for a long time. And actually, if you see at this chart, those are the initial starting doses. Target doses are uh, very different. If you look at in NLP, it 
you can increase the dose up to 10 to 20 milligrams twice daily if the patient is tolerating that kind of doses. And if you go with beta blockers, you can go up to 10 milligrams daily. So th that is uh, the, if, if you are going for bisprolol. So it's very important to see whether the patient is getting uh, maximum tolerated doses before, before we, de we decide patient is not responding to treatment. One of the problems uh, we see in our medical clinics and uh, other practices is there is some degree of uh, clinic, uh, clinical inertia. We like to keep the treatment the way it is. So you sometimes see many uh, clinic records will say continue same or continue same treatment. So either it, it may be due to various reasons. You might be seeing, seeing lot, lots of patients in the clinic, uh, there, there may be inadequate time, but ultimately it will not uh, improve the patient's symptoms and patient will deteriorate over time. So it's before you categorize heart failure as stage D or uh, heart failure, which is not responding to treatment or in stage heart failure, it's very important to try to give maximum tolerated dose of uh, the guideline directed medi medications. So if you look at diuretics, diuretics, if they have fluid retention, diuretics are recommended to relieve congestion, improve symptoms and prevent worsening heart failure. Uh, if they do not, I mean, first, first option is uh, usually the loop diuretics. If they are not responding to the adequate doses of loop diuretics, you might add uh, thiazide type diuretic like metallosone, but you know that it's very important to uh, watch the electrolytes when you do this. And, and patients who are not responding to that as well, you can start iron drops sometimes. And there's new devices like left ventricular assist devices, mechanical circulatory support for patients who are not responding to uh, adequate guideline medical, uh, guideline directed medical therapy. Uh, so this is usually used as a bridge to cardiac transplant. Uh, so these are the usual indications for this kind of uh, uh, advanced treatment options. They are not freely available in Sri Lanka and they are very costly. So for all uh, purposes, we can consider these treatment options are not uh, for our patients. So even if uh, in other countries, they might categorize patient as needing left ventricular assist devices or transplant. We do not have a, a organized transplant program as well for cardiac transplants. So they, these are basically off limits for our, our patients, unfortunately. So cardiac transplant for selected patients with advanced heart failure, despite goal-directed medical therapy, guideline-directed medical therapy, cardiac transplantation can improve survival and quality of life. Uh, survival after cardiac transplant and Transplantation approaches 15 years. That is a significant amount of lengthening of life. It also improves functional status and health-related quality of life. So after the, all the, those treatment option, options are exhausted, you have to go for the palliative care. Actually, it's not correct because palliative care starts when the diagnosis is made, not, not only when the patient uh, is having in-stage heart failure. So but the, the burden, on, uh, burden on palliative care team will increase as the time goes on. In the early, early stages, it's mainly for the symptom relief, but palliative care team have more inputs when the patient gets worsening heart failure. Uh, so palliative care is both patient and family-centered care that uh, optimizes health-related quality of life by anticipating pre and uh, preventing and treating suffering. This should be integrated into the care of all heart failure patients. Palliative and supportive care has a role across all stages of heart failure, starting early in the spectrum, intensifying in end stage disease, extending to caregiver bereavement as well after the patient has passed away. So this is a chart which shows the progression of heart failure. So after the diagnosis and the time goes on, initially they may respond to our guideline directed medical therapy and there will be uh, periods of clinical instability where patient may need admissions or heart failure related hospitalizations where they may need IV diuretics and anthropic support 
and they may not come to their previous baseline after a hospital admission. So they, that is the place where you need more and more supportive and palliative care. So ultimately they have poor response to treatment or they start uh, the intolerance to the treatment develops. Like you can't give AC inhibitors because the patient's blood pressure is very low like that. So then finally the death. So end of life care becomes more important in this, uh, the later stages, but actually it starts when the diagnosis is actually made. So this is the same chart. Uh, which shows the transition into advanced heart failure. Uh, the the disease-modifying therapies are important at the diagnosis of the disease. And later, when the patient decompensates and develops from failure, uh, need of the palliative symptom, the palliative therapies uh, go up, and disease-modifying therapies we might have to discontinue. These are the factors predicting poor prognosis in uh, severe heart failure. Increasing age, dependent for more than three activities of daily living, cardiac ataxia, where they can't eat anything and they get, lose weight and the muscle mass, resistant hyponatremia to treatment, low serum albumin levels, increased BNP values, and multiple shocks if they are wearing ICD, if they have comorbidities like cancer. So, so those are the supportive things which shows that patient is going towards end stage heart failure and end of life. So this is a very important question we got, we get uh, when we get, we make a diagnosis of heart failure and the, the, the term heart failure itself is frightening. So patients will tend to ask how many days they have got. So it is very difficult to prognosticate heart failure than even um, some, of, some of the other uh, chronic illnesses where you uh, need palliative care like cancer. So, uh, so some because it's because of now some patients sometimes respond to the therapies and uh, patients who had re recurrent hospital admissions may become better after some time. So prognostication is not easy. Uh, so there are some aspects we can consider patients with advanced heart failure are likely to have multiple hospital admissions. Uh, and they are walking on a tightrope between renal impairment and fluid overload. That means uh, when the patient is congested, we admit and start on diuretics. Then when, when we discharge the patient, when the congestion is relieved, and then they come with severe dehydration and renal impairment. So clinicians are also struggling to balance the congestion and the renal impairment and the uh, dizziness due to hypotension. So it's, it's you have to achieve a fine balance, but it's not a easy thing to do. So this is this is the this is the gap between the the quality of life deficit. So the patient's hopes and aspirations are at a higher level. They expect a higher uh, quality of life from treatment, but the reality is uh, uh, somewhere below their expectations. So if sometimes with time they may have their expectations will get modified with your counseling and repeated clinic visits. And uh, they might improve on medical treatment. So, so, so their quality of life may improve with treatment. So with time, our, our goal is to uh, come to a more closer level, uh, patient expectations and the uh, reality. So why, why the healthcare professionals are reluctant to introduce palliative care? So we might think, so he has some time, so we don't need to do it now. Today we can't do it because we, may, we don't have time. Our clinic is busy, we don't have time to discuss these things. Uh, will the patient become emotional, right? Whether she will get depressed, whether she will have suicidal ideas. And will the patient and the family think we are incompetent? That's why we are discussing about end of life because we can't treat it. And we may also worry, am I the right person to tell him? Shouldn't our consultant do it? Uh, should, the, should, the, should the junior registrar do it? Is, it? is it my job? So because of various reasons, we do not discuss the palliative care and the symptom relief, those things. 
So they may, they, they may result in people dying unprepared and there may be inadequate symptom control and there is no advanced care planning. And I always think cost is also uh, is an important thing, important factor, especially in our resourceful settings. Patients getting admitted to ICUs, ventilated on nine drops for weeks. So acute care bed utilization, all those things cost money. So the, the, if you are, if you are uh, managing patient, managing a severe end-stage heart failure in ICU with mitral ion drops, uh, other patients who may have a chance of survival may not get those beds. So we have to think of those factors as well. So these are the patients with heart failure in whom end of life care should be considered. Progressive functional decline, physically and mentally, and dependence in most activities of daily living. Severe heart failure symptoms with poor quality of life despite optimal pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments. Frequent admissions to the hospital or other serious episodes of decompensation despite optimal treatment. And heart transplantation and mechanical circulatory support is ruled out. So in all uh, purposes, we can consider our patients do not have that access. Cardiac ataxia clinically judged to be close to end of life. So it's a clinical decision. Uh, if you are not sure, you can discuss with your colleagues, you can get a second opinion and come to the diagnosis. The patient is in end-stage heart failure and he should be end of life. He should be end of on an end-of-life care pathway. Uh, so they have high symptom burden, as we previously discussed. Quality of life can be poor for both patients and also carers. They have often multiple comor comorbidities there will be inevitable deterioration. Uh, recurrent admissions with uh, fluid overload or acute and chronic renal failure in the final stages. So if you look at the challenges to the clinician in starting palliative care, there are too many symptoms. There are too many drugs and devices. Patients are on various devices that we may be unfamiliar with. And we don't know where to start. We may feel that our knowledge is not enough uh, regarding these decisions. And we might fear that we might make the things worse. And we, are, we may be reluctant to stop the drugs our senior colleagues may have started before. And there are always, every year, there are new drugs coming, new interventions coming, difficult to keep up. We don't know whether this patient may have a benefit of a new therapy. And may lead to, this may lead to physician burnout. So they, they take medicines for various uh, comorbidities. They have multiple complaints. They feel dizzy, breathless, edema, nausea, constipation, poor mobility, constipated. They are, may, might be in pain. They have low mood. They, they have fatigue and social isolation. These are the various expressions they use uh, to describe their uh, constellation of their different kinds of symptoms. So these are uh, the new developments in heart failure. We have sacubitril valsartan. I mean, it's not a really new development. It has been there for some time now, but it's only now we are getting the access to these drugs. We have Vibradine and uh, there are new studies, Ironman study on uh, use of iron infusions. SGLT2 inhibitors, again, well-established treatment. A new drug called Verisuguet, which is a soluble guanylate cyclic stimulator. Uh, in Victoria trial, it showed benefit in patients with worsening heart failure specifically. And potassium lowering drugs uh, like sodium zirconium cyclosilicate and patiroma, which were used to control hyperkalemia. So we may be able to continue giving uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist and ACE inhibitors. And the new things like CRT, ICD, CRTD, left ventricular assist devices and transplants. So these are the things people might think, oh, these, these things are available. So whether we should go for palliation or whether we should go for this advanced medication and interventions. So the, that is one of the issues for the physicians. Right, looking at the symptom control. <clears throat> so to treat breathlessness, there are some non-pharmacological measures like 
using a fan, right? And sometimes opioids, small amounts, oral morphine, they can help. Uh, slight leg swelling will respond to elevation and we might have to increase the dose of diuretics. Patient might have difficulty sleeping. That may be due to depression or uh, effect of the diuretics causing patient to pass uh, uh, urine in the night. Uh, and patient might complain of their abdomen is swollen and they can't eat. It could be due to constipation or fluid accumulation in the abdominal cavity. They may have confusion, so you have to check the electrolytes and check whether it's due to drug-induced uh, side effects or these patients are prone to get vascular dementia. So those symptom control is very important in palliation. So we are, we are moving towards symptom control from uh, the long-term prognostic medications. So there are, in addition to the physical symptoms, there are psychological symptoms as well. They also need to be controlled. If they have depression and anxiety, you might have to refer to a, a psychiatrist. Uh, they may have the fear of being a burden to the family and fear of death. So every, everyone, everyone is afraid of death. There may be the fear of dying. And they might be asking the question, why it happens to me? All those symptoms, uh, psychological symptoms, also need to be addressed. So this is this can't be done by a single person. It, it's not a palliative care physician or a cardiologist cannot do this alone. They need a team. It's a teamwork, and also carers. So the family needs to be involved. So that's how you can get a, a patient-centered heart failure care. There are cardiac rehabilitation programs community heart failure nurses. So all those patients should get together and decide that this patient is no longer for escalation of uh, prognostic medications or CRT devices or left ventricular assist devices or transplantation. This patient is better off just the, with, with just the palliative care and symptom control. So that decision has to be taken by the uh, combination of those professionals in consultation with the patient and the family. So these are the components of a palliative care service uh, with advanced heart failure. Therefore, our focus is improving the quality of life of the patient and the family. We have to assess symptoms frequently because symptom control is our one of our priorities. Uh, and we have to we, may, we have to make the pay, uh, we have to make available uh, the spiritual and psychological support the, that kind of care available uh, with ready access and we have to also have advanced care planning like where where, where does the patient going to live and die whether are we going to admit the patient to the hospital if they, the patient gets deteriorated uh, what are we going to do in, a, in the case of cardiac arrest, whether we are going ahead with the DNR order. So don't, those things, uh, those are the other uh, advanced care planning is very important because uh, it will, it will, uh, it will be like kind of a pathway or, or a flow chart to do. Uh, so th there will not be any doubt what to do when something happens. So high quality communication is one of the domains of care, which is central to palliative care. Uh, we have to convey the prognosis. And uh, it's, it's studies have shown the patients and families overestimate their survival. And the overestimate, they also overestimate the potential benefits of treatment. So they have higher expectations. But we have to insert discussions about uncertainty uh, and uh, deliver that there is a risk of dying, there is a risk of deterioration. And we have to clarify goals of care. What our, uh, so our goals of care, we are not going to uh, 
introduce treatments which prolong life like ICD, frequent hospitalizations, NG tube feeding, right? And we are mainly focused on treating pain and suffering, treating breathlessness, and uh, making the journey towards inevitable death less painful and uh, more enjoyable. Uh, and another domain is shared decision making. Decision making, uh, as I discussed earlier, it has the decision making is done by not only by the clinician, by the family, the patient, uh, heart failure nurses, and uh, uh, the critical care specialists as well as palliative care specialists. And it's very important. Uh, symptom and we already discussed. Caregiver support is very important because sometimes pay, pay, there is caregiver burnout. Patient after caring for a uh, heart failure patient for a long time, carers may also have psychological issues, depression. They, they, their health may also deteriorate, so they, they need support. Now we come to the, the palliative care consultation. We have to set an agenda with the patient for the consultation. Now, this is not a, not something, I mean, we, 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 we tell these things, but it's not very easy to uh, discuss these things with some of our patients because, I, you, I mean, you may have experienced some patients, uh, their level of understanding may be poor. The family's level of understanding will be poor. Uh, they do not uh, appreciate that what... Uh, uh, this kind of discussions. What they want is, uh, okay, doctor, what do whatever is right. Save our patient. Will will take all measures to save our patient. So they so that kind of inputs we will get from your patients and families. So it's not easy to set an agenda about the palliative care consultation. Uh, so therefore, you might have to uh, uh, involve many people as uh, from the family as much as possible because then uh, if a patient has several sons and daughters you can get all of them down with, um, with the consent of the patient and then someone will be and at least be able to understand what we are going to do here uh, so if the patient is having fatigue uh, we have to check for reversible causes including an anemia uh, we have to check pulse, blood pressure, heart rate before making the changes to any medications. And we have to review medications and stop uh, inappropriate medications. So de-prescribing is, is, is also important, like prescribing. Uh, you have to remember that in heart failure, beta blockers, AC inhibitors, and diuretics and uh, MRAs, they all not they all not only improve prognosis, they are also important for symptom control. So if the patient can tolerate these drugs, it's better to keep at least a uh, little bit of AC inhibitors and beta blockers on the prescription. Uh, and also you have to be wary about stopping anti antigenous because that may give rise to more symptoms. And we have to be very cautious about stopping beta blockers. There are many patients who cannot tolerate beta blockers. They get fatigue, they feel unwell. So stopping beta blockers may be important for some patients to relieve symptoms. Um, but uh, we have to be careful because sometimes the, the, the patient may pre, uh, get predisposed to arrhythmias when you stop beta blockers and angina may worsen and the heart failure may worsen. Uh, with regard to atrial fibrillation, we focus on rate control um, because it will reduce symptoms. So anticoagulation, rhythm control are not uh, uh, high on our uh, priority. Coming to the ethical considerations, stopping drugs that improve prognosis to have a better quality of life. So that is one of the ethical dilemma. So we know that ACE inhibitors, MRAs, beta blockers, they improve prognosis, uh, but we may have to stop those medications, some of them at least, to minimize the number of drugs patient is taking and give room to give more 
uh, drugs for symptom control. And the, to anticoagulate or not to anticoagulate. Now, anticoagulants may complicate everything because if you want to give warfarin or new oral anticoagulants for a patient who, are, who is in end of life, that may cause bleeding because these patients are very frail uh, and susceptible to falls and they are, they are not eating, so they get uh, uh, their INR is labile. So it's not easy to anticoagulate. On the other hand, if you do not anticoagulate, there's the risk of getting a stroke. So, which will worsen the symptoms. So, it's a, another delay. And the deactivation of the ICDs. Uh, we have to discuss with the patient that we are going to deactivate the ICD because uh, it will deliver shocks inappropriately. Uh, or even if appropriate, the, it will hinder the uh, dying process. Um, so if we do a DNA, DNA CPR in those with, uh, those with an active ICD, um, uh, it would, uh, so the ICD can deliver shocks in the case of VT and VF. But in the case of uh, uh, asystolic arrest or pastor's electrical activity, uh, even if there's ICD, it will not fire. So coming to the advanced care planning, death is not the opposite of life, it's a bar, part of it. So it's an advanced care planning is an opportunity to help patients understand that they may have a poor prognosis. So when we discuss, uh, we, we ask a patient now, uh, you are getting multiple hospital admissions. Uh, we don't think you are getting any better with the treatment we have. So we have exhausted all the therapeutic options so we have to decide what to do in the future, that kind of discussion. It, this will help patients understand they, that they may have a poor prognosis. And we have to explain choices the individuals may or may not have. For example, I will discuss with my patients who are at end-stage heart failure that uh, advanced therapies like cardiac transplant or left ventricular assist devices, unfortunately, they are not available to them. And to, we have to start conversations in families about what might lie ahead. To advance care planning also involves to help people to understand that they are not going to live forever. So these are the things we have to discuss. Preferred place of care, whether they are going to live at home, whether they are going to live at a hospice, or they are going to spend their last days in the hospital. So we don't have uh, that kind of proper hospice care in Sri Lanka because I think our palliative care is still it's, it's developing, but still is in infancy. Uh, so we do, we do have to find a preferred place of care because patients may be better off in a hospice because if the patient is at home and they are dependent on their carer, uh, the patient and the carer both will suffer. Sometimes they, they do better uh, when they are placed in a hospice care. Do not attempt CPR. We have to decide whether we are going to de uh, fill a DNR CPR form. But the, the legal framework, I think, still has been developed in Sri Lanka for the DNA CPR. But of course, uh, as clinicians, we see that some patients, they are not going to make it. So we get the family down and tell them that it's not going to, uh, we are not going to put this patient in the ICU. We are not going to give electric shocks to this patient. We are not going to uh, start advanced antibiotics. We are not going to feed with NG. So the family will understand now what they are saying is this patient is nearing end of life. Sometimes we might even ask them to take the patient home and give whatever the patient like to eat and be with the family. Uh, that is one. And then uh, although we do not have a legal framework, I think, uh, our clinicians are more than capable to decide the patient may not need DNA. I do not think there will be any legal uh, aspects, legal problems, if you do not resuscitate a patient who you honestly think uh, resuscitation would be futile. Uh, and we have to prescribe drugs in the end-of-life care bundle, like for pain, morphine, for secretions, hyacin, uh, if the patient can't sleep, you can give some medicine or fits. Uh, 
list of contact numbers. If the patient gets deteriorated, who to inform? And when the patient is incapacitated, who has the power of attorney to handle the legal matters? Uh, discussion about bills and funerals. Planning for the worst, hoping for the best. These are the drugs we use at the part of the end of life care pathway. Morphine, metazolam, haloperidol, uh, hyoscyanoglycoparinium for secretions, fusimide for edema and breathlessness. So we, we look at a typical patient. Uh, it's a Mr. One, Mr. T from Dallin, <laughs> came from. Uh, he's a retired school principal, so he understands what we are doing. He understands what is happening to him. 74, he has multiple comorbidities. Ejection fraction is 15%, CVLV dysfunction. Uh, he has had a CRP as well, because uh, we had one of the cardiac electrophysiologists working here who were very enthusiastic. Uh, he's got COPD, diabetes, CKD, peripheral vascular disease. He had six admissions last last six months, four for decompensated heart failure, needing intravenous therapy, intravenous diuretic therapy, one with medication induced AKI and hyperkalemia, once for blood transfusion and once for dizziness. So there is general significant decline in last six months, weight loss, frailty and cachexia. Patient understands it. Patient knows that he is getting weaker day by day. He may have some confusion at times. Uh, he has, a, although he has had uh, the CRTD, there are there were no shocks. This is his medication chart. You can see uh, there is polypharmacy. Unfortunately, we can't help it because we have to control his diabetes. We have to control his heart failure. We have to address his asthma or COPD. So he's on all the therapies. So his problems are he's feeling dizzy all the time because we are giving high dose of uh, trans inhibitors and he has a fear of falls. He's feeling uh, unwell and tired all the time. He has aching in the legs. There's no appetite. He's most of the time is constipated. Of course, he's always breathless on exertion. He's taking too many drugs. New drugs are costly like sacubital valsartan is original drug is more than 350 rupees per one per tablet. Certain drugs are, even if he has money, certain drugs are not available. It's difficult to get those drugs. And there are too many clinics. There is no one to accompany him. I mean, he has grown up children, but they are they are they also have their own jobs, so there is no one to accompany him. And he's also frustrated in not being able to be productive. So this is this size uh, on the left side, you will see his uh, vitals and the investigation findings and the, his clinics are, he has cardiology clinic and there was a vascular clinic follow-up and there was a plan for fem fempop by bypass. I think it's never going to happen because of uh, poor LV function and diabetic clinic, uh, nephrology clinic. Last time they said there is no need for him to come again. He's on respiratory clinic follow-up and orthopedic clinic follow-up for his knee problems. So you see, he has to come to about six clinics. Even if he gets medication for two months at a time, still he has to come about three visits every month. So we have to make sure that he does not have that many clinic appointments. So symptom control is priority. Review medications. Uh, we stopped STMI and statin. We, we, have, we are considering whether we, should, we are going to stop offering. And pantoprazole also not really required. And we are trying to rationalize his hospital appointments. We'll issue whatever the drugs from the cardiology clinic, other clinics, most of them we can stop. We'll issue those drugs also from our clinic. Uh, and we referred him to the psychiatrist and we got down his family and discuss what is happening. Um, and we are now thinking about the activity in the ICD. And advanced care planning, of course, there is no other place for him to die. He will, he will either die at home, there is no hospices here, or he may have to come, he, the, the family, if, if he become acutely breathless, family will have no choice other, other than getting him down, get, getting him to the hospital. So this about medication optimization, 
uh, we have to know the indication before stopping these medications. We have to consult with the heart failure nurse or the GP in the case of other countries or the cardiologist. Um, so if the patient is has having a pacemaker or ICD, before stopping beta blockers, we have to discuss with the cardiologist. Otherwise, the uh, patient might start getting shocks. So in your practice, prefer, uh, refer patients to palliative care for deteriorating symptomatic patients. Consider if you would be surprised if your patient dies within the next year. Think when the, your patient in the clinic sits before you, think uh, whether this patient will die within the next year. So that means that patient should be referred to palliative care. Uh, so if you think this patient will die, within the next year. Address advanced care planning, including preferred place of care, preferred place of death, whether they want to go to the hospital if they deteriorate, what about CPR, whether we are going to prescribe end-of-life medicines, discuss this with family members. Uh, if you do this regularly, it will make life so much easier for your colleagues and will improve the way that people die. So it's always better to die surrounded by your loved ones in a quiet surrounding. Uh, if you are a religious person listening to whatever the religious uh, uh, scripts, um, rather than dying in a hospital, which is very uh, uh, crowded place with multiple tubes, people pressing on your chest. So if you, I mean, if you get that idea, people will think twice for how they want to die. So when do you refer? Following a change in circumstances. So if you diagnose, if you get a new diagnosis, or if the patient deteriorates, if the patient has new admission for heart failure, if the patient gets admitted to a care home, or if given a relevant cue by, cue by the patient or family. So those are the instances where you can refer the patient to palliative care. So it's better to burn out rather than to fade away. So that, this is the end of our discussion today. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sunit Karnaratna. Very informative uh, lecture. A lot of things I also personally, you know, learned. And it's really nice the way you get the heart failure towards palliative care practice. And um, it is, I think this is the way that you should treat, you should communicate with your patients. It's really, really interesting. And yes, true that you mentioned Sri Lanka, still we don't have, you know, proper places where you can... Uh, uh, transfer or you can direct your patients, such patients like, uh, you know, fully equipped hospices. But little by little, we are doing good. When you compare with those good old days, now at least we are talking about palliative care. The concern about palliative care is there. And I'm really, really happy that your concerns, I'm sure... Because of the background in UK, the two, three years you worked there in NHSL, uh, the UK grant, that is why I think you especially mentioned about the community heart failure nurses. Actually, to come to that level in Sri Lanka, our nurses, the community heart failure nurses, I think we must pray for that. But it is coming. It is coming. Don't worry. Now, Earlier, we were not talking about nurses who will do palliative care, but we have now public health nurses uh, who are trained, who are doing a wonderful service, wonderful service at, at the, you know, the ground level. So that's really interesting. So times to come, Dr. Sunit, there will be community heart failure nurses also. Uh, we will be, you know, I'm sure. So, and your effort, and you said uh, 
what you all are doing from now Anuradhapura is not considering as a periphery, no? Now it's a teaching hospital, but with almost all the facilities. Maybe you all are having facilities more than Colombo now. I don't know. So, but it's a line ministry thing, no? But anyway, uh, anyway, it's really superb lecture. Very eye-opening and, you know, the way you put the heart failure patients, how to manage in palliative care setup, it's really interesting and very informative. Thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. And I will open the floor now to anyone to ask questions or clarifications or discussions, or you can share your, you know, experience with Dr. Sunit for a few minutes. So I will open the floor. I saw... Uh, Dr. Janaki Vidana Patrina, Dr. Tusita, Dr. Lukshanti from England also uh, join with this. So you all can uh, ask any clarifications and anything. And you you mentioned about the DNA CPR. Yes, in Sri Lanka yes. still we don't have uh, legislations for the DNA CPR like such another countries, but very correctly you mentioned our clinicians are you know well equipped and they know the knowledge and uh, I'm also pretty sure no one will argue before the courts why you haven't done the CPR or something if you know the two consultants uh, can decide yeah but uh, as a college as a professional body now we have started the discussion with several stakeholders to get get something uh, legalized in Sri Lanka also. So it is very good. And the other thing, and uh, Dr. Sunit, or you can also you know contribute hugely. Now we are we have opened a discussion to make the advanced care plan. You know, at least to. Uh, get the circular, ministerial circular. So when and how and where we are going to do this advanced care planning, because still it is not happening. And in your case, your example, you said, uh, you said um, the family members, they don't have a choice unless admitting uh, this patient, even though you have from your clinic, you said, uh, no need for the admissions, but there's no, you know, no any other options for the family members. They cannot just, but I think times to come uh, with the advancement of the knowledge of palliative care and the awareness of palliative care among the general public, these scenarios might change. And now we are introducing this shared care plan also where the MOIC or a medical officer at the periphery unit can understand the value of palliative care and uh, they can do what the consultants shared care plan at the at the at their level so with that we can reduce the unnecessary hospital admissions to the tertiary care centers i am sure you all are overburdened with this thing so it will happen time to time and I'm very happy to have you in our boat as a palliative, you know, interested in palliative care as a cardiologist. So I'm very happy. So I can see Lushanti also, any any um, any examples or in your expertise, anything you want to share? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was an excellent lecture, Sunet, um, and it covered a lot and... Uh, um, I, I would like to ask this question. I know in UK, it's very easy um, uh, to uh, communicate with patients and to explain that um, they are now um, now nearing the uh, end of life or they need a palliative care plan. Most of the time, they accept that. How easy in, I mean, I, I when I was working as a consultant in Sri Lanka, I have tried... Uh, in some instances where I tried a lot 
to explain the families that the patient is, we are not going to gain anything with the active treatment. We rather go for palliative care, but it had been a very difficult task. So um, how easy when, especially with regards to heart failure, if it's a cancer, they understand that, but in heart failure, how easy to convince them, um, uh, Sunet, uh, in your patients? Yeah, uh, actually one issue is their level of understanding. After you take some time, uh, 15 minutes and uh, discuss everything, then mm -hmm. you finish it. Sometimes uh, the children will come and ask you, Dr. Hinam, why are you not going to be a doctor? So it's not, I mean, it's not, as, they do not uh, understand what we are talking about. So it's uh, their level of understanding is at that kind of level so you may need mm. more time with them more, multiple yeah. sessions more time uh, to make them come to your level of uh, thinking so it's yeah. one of the issues other issue is actually although we think because uh, as Sri Lankans uh, from our religious background we, you may think that uh, our people should be more ready to die than the westerners but Unfortunately, in practice, it's not so. Uh, yeah. Our people do not like to, uh, I mean, even if they are very unwell and even if they are suffer suffering, they do not think, uh, they do not want to think they had a good life and it's time to go. They just want to hang on. That's yeah, I think that they do not accept it. Yeah. Yeah, I think we should, I mean, um, we should start uh, as, as uh, because here we have the community level as well as the hospital level. The, uh, Sri Lanka, is, the involvement is less. So uh, I, I know when I was in this college, so we tried to go to uh, uh, the peripheral, uh, not, I mean, not peripheral, the hospitals, not uh, close to Colombo and do some um, uh, uh, teaching and some programs to uh, increase their awareness. I think we should start from the ground level, I suppose, uh, because not only the uh, medical uh, persons, I think we should um, target the public as well about um, increasing the awareness of palliative care. Because people in our, our country mostly think that palliative care is for uh, cancers. That's the main issue. Yeah, very correct, very correct. Actually, I can remember, so when Lushanti also, as a council member, we did the capacity building programs. And yes, yeah. I agree I, I agree with you. We need more and more, you know, awareness, capacity building programs, not only among medical professionals, but other, other colleagues also, other public also. And very important point, Dr. Sunit, you mentioned about the de-prescribed. That is very, very difficult to do from a medical hand. So I think it's very good point you pointed out. In When you consider the palliative care, so you have to, you know, chop off many, many, especially, you know, drugs, isn't it? So yes. how practically you are seeing this, you're not seeing, no? We so, just put uh, repeat all and send. Yes, uh, actually for us, uh, because many of the drugs have started by us, it's not yeah. very difficult for us to stop. But the uh, thing is, is uh, when it, the patient goes to the periphery, they, the doctors might feel inadequate. Uh, their knowledge, they might feel their knowledge is not adequate to uh, stop those medications. That is, so they they need to be empowered to do that. Yeah, and and you... I need to add one more thing. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So that about ICD and pacemaker in yeah. our setup uh, for ICD, unless they are in of life, we do not deactivate. Uh, mm. uh, and the pacemaker, we just leave it. Uh, even the patient is end of life. That's how the practice uh, we do here in our hospital. Uh, I, I may be, um, it, it may be not the same uh, in everywhere, but that's the practice I just want to ask. Do you, I mean, unless the patient is end of life care, we do not uh, uh, deactivate the ICD uh, or we don't do anything for the pacemaker usually. Um, 
uh, is there uh, I, I just want to ask you is there anything uh, any different thing um, in yeah, other it's, places it's very, it's very real we get one of those instances so actually if yeah. we, we get such a patient with a crtd uh, mm. if the patient is end of life and actively dying we may deactivate it otherwise we, we wouldn't do it yeah thank you and um, uh, i can also remember so now you mentioned about the non pharmacological things especially for breathlessness i can remember in our hospice in mathara we had a typical case of heart failure you know amazingly a simple fan comforted her in a huge way so those things i think we have to you know uh get uh, you know in our day to day practice so where you very nicely mentioned that non pharmacological things for the breathlessness as well and the spiritual care and the the spiritual care also there is a huge place especially particularly in heart failure patients because we are also frightened no when you, you hear your heart is failing isn't it it's not unless your kidneys are failing or liver failing or some or cancer but heart fail is very very frightening thing. so you have to have a good communication and so it's uh, time to come it will happen you all have to take the leadership and uh, it will happen so any other clarification any questions dr tusita okay so that means uh, no further questions clarification so anyway our time also up so thank you so much once again dr sunet and you are very most welcome to our council also next council sunet lushanti sunet is going to be our council member so wow that's... excellent excellent yes, he's yes, a, yes. he's a, he's an excellent doctor i can i'm re... I usually recommend him as a cardiologist, and he's a good person as well. Yeah, yeah excellent. Yeah. But still, we miss you in our council. <laughs> so, Lushanti can it... start, uh, uh, you know, the sub sub council in UK. UK. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. thank you so much for joining our webinars, Dr. Janaki. and dr tusita and everybody so most of our colleagues from our wound care setup and the nurses everybody so thank you so much thank you once again dr sunet for a brilliant excellent presentation thank you bye good night good night